All right, everybody. So we're going to go ahead and um, get started. Um, it is my pleasure to invite you all and to welcome you all to our panel tonight. Um, we are really excited. This is uh, really the first time that our program has started to um, engage in this type of kind of outreach where we want to really get to know um, both pre-medical students, post-bac students, master's program students, or really anybody that is interested in training as a physician scientist. And um, my name is Joe Garrity. I'll explain a little bit about myself and some of our panelists in a minute. Um, but I wanted to just say that we're really excited to have you all here. And really just to start off, we wanna start with just kind of some overall kind of ground rules. Um, if everybody could please mute their microphones, um, we're going to go through what the agenda for this evening will look like. The session is being recorded, um, and if you would like a recording of the session, you can feel free to email me afterwards. My email was listed on the flyer, and I will uh, list it on the next slide. So if everybody could just mute uh, and make sure that they're muted for the duration of the presentation um, until we get to the Q&A at the end. And then of course you can feel free to unmute yourself and, and make sure you have your video on and everything like that. Okay, great. So um, like I said, my name is Joe Garrity. I'm a, a seventh year MD PhD student here at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in the medical scientist training program. And um, I'm also uh, privileged to serve as our vice president of outreach and community uh, for our student affairs council. And this is something that our student body has been really interested in is how do we kind of um, show other students who are maybe um, earlier or younger than us kind of what it's like to train as a physician scientist um, and really kind of give back to the community and help explain what this career option looks like to other students for many of us didn't really hear about this type of training opportunity until much uh, later in our undergraduate careers. So today we're going to talk about MD-PhD training, combining careers in science and medicine, and I want to introduce you to our lovely panel of students um, here. So uh, I will kind of just um, give them each an opportunity to kind of present themselves. Here I'm listing um, their name, their year in the program, which I'll explain what the G and the M acronyms mean um, a little bit later on in the talk. Um, and then our contact information. And like I said, you can feel free to always e email me or reach out to me on social media or anything like that. Um, the first thing I'll say is uh, one of the themes you'll hear about is that it is an extensive training process. So you could see my picture here on the left and how it's changed over the course of seven years. Um, but I will say that I would do it all again. Um, and so what we're gonna do tonight is um, give some introductions to our student panelists. I will provide an overview of MD-PhD training, what it's like to be a physician scientist and what the programs and curricula look like. And then we'll have a few moderated questions and answers that were submitted to us in advance. And then we'll open it up to everybody else to kind of uh, ask whatever questions come to mind. So with that in mind, um, we're gonna intro our panelists. And these are the eight uh, things that I kind of came up with. Uh, for our students to uh, introduce themselves with. So, and we're gonna go in uh, the order that I listed here. So we'll start with myself, then we'll go to Corey, Nathan, Maggie, Juliana, and then Reggie. Um, and we're kind of going from some of the older students in the program to some of the younger students in the program. So like I said, my name is Joe Garrity. I actually grew up in West Islip, New York, uh, which is a suburb of New York City. I went to the State University of New York College of Geneseo and majored in both biochemistry and Spanish. Um, my, um, I'm currently in the seventh year of the program, so I'm actually in the process of finishing up and writing my dissertation for my PhD uh, in neuroscience, which I'm aiming to defend in March. Um, and then I will return to medical school clerkships in April. Um, my research interests are in neuroscience in particular. I'm really interested in the interaction between the immune system and the brain. Uh, so this field of neuroimmunology and how it fits into the understanding of critical or traumatic brain injuries. So my PhD is actually studying a type of hemorrhagic stroke that results from trauma or from ruptured aneurysms and how that can actually lead to inflammation in the brain as well as seizures. Clinically, I'm interested in neurosurgery, anesthesiology, and neurology. 
um, focusing on neurocritical illness. And long-term career goals, I'd love to have a blend of um, clinical care, caring for patients, research, um, as well as education and mentorship. Um, and some other passions or hobbies, um, I just ran my first marathon about a month ago. So that was really fun, even though it wasn't uh, the big exciting thing that it was supposed to be. Um, but it's something that I am really enjoyed and I'm looking forward to running the in-person one next year. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey Ryder, who is a third year medical student uh, and she can explain all of this information about herself. Thanks, Joe. Um, so yeah, as you said, my name's Corey. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I grew up in Denver, um, and that is where I went to undergrad at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. Um, so not the big campus. I wanted a small university experience. Um, and I can explain a little bit more about how I had specific challenges getting into MD, PhD because of my undergrad institution. And if anybody has questions, obviously hit me up about that. Um, my major was in neuroscience, um, which I then also pursued for my PhD. I am, like Joe said, I'm in my M3 year, even though I'm a seventh year MD PhD student. So I already defended my PhD last year, right before COVID hit. And now I am in medical school doing my rotations through the different specialties in medicine. Um, my research interests, are so I can say what they have been, where they're going. Um, but my PhD was in neuroscience um, alongside Joe. Um, and I studied uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so it was a pediatric neurologic condition that results in demyelination. My specific research interest is in multiple sclerosis, which is adult neurodegenerative myelin loss. Um, and I did a lot of research on extracellular vesicles as a mode of pathology in demyelinating disease, and then also looked specifically at lipid biology, um, which has been a budding interest for me since then. My clinical interests are currently evolving. So even though I did my PhD in neuroscience, I'm starting to think I might want to be an ob guide. I really dug that rotation. It was awesome, but you know, I gotta see how it is for the rest of my rotations when I actually get to neuro and psych and all the other things. Um, my long-term career goals are definitely gonna be to stay in academia. Um, my PhD experience was a little bumpy, but I still think I wanna do research. Um, I'm definitely gonna be in the clinic a ton, but uh, it kind of all remains to be seen in my evolving interests. You wanna run the dishwasher so we don't move? Hey, oh good, she got it. All right, so my long-term career goals are those, and my other passions um, are, are many, but one, the big one, is probably my dog Toast, who's chilling. Oh, that's my chair. You can see him begging dad for dinner over there. Um, otherwise, it's probably wellness and how to maintain a good work-life balance, specifically as people going through long training and rigorous activities. Um, so medical training, and even physician wellness is a huge passion of mine. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I'll pass it on to the next person. Awesome, thank you so much, Corey. So our next person is Nathan. All right, hey everyone, uh, my name is Nathan. I apologize that you see me driving in my car. I got caught in traffic and uh, running a few minutes behind today, but uh, I grew up in uh, Hialeah, Florida. It's a good town in uh, Miami-Dade County. I went to uh, Johns Hopkins for college. I majored in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Uh, I'm now in the second year of my PhD, so I'm a G2. Um, my current research interests are uh, targeted bile acid proteomics uh, and also investigating the uh, gut liver access in inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, in terms of clinical interests, uh, I really don't have a solid idea there yet, but uh, I could see myself perhaps even going from like GI uh, even to like uh, ENT, uh, like microsurgery. Uh, so pretty uh, undecided there. Uh, long term, um, you know, I'd, I'd, obviously I want to be a, a doctor and do research, uh, probably at an academic institution, but I'd also like to ideally have some kind of industry involvement as well. Uh, and then for some of my hobbies, um, 
I also have a dog, which I really enjoy. Uh, I like uh, fantasy football, boxing, and um, what else? And I play piano. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, next up is Maggie. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie. Um, I'm a G1 in the program, so I'm a third year MD-PhD student. Um, I'm originally from a really small town in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, called Horicon, Wisconsin. Um, but I went to Loyola University in Chicago for my undergrad, where I majored in biophysics. Um, research interests. So I am currently doing my PhD in the School of Public Health in Epidemiology. So it's the study of etiology of diseases, population-based research, um, human subjects research. And so I'm currently interested in um, the environmental impacts on health, specifically metal and metalloid exposures and how that impacts the risk and basically trajectory of chronic diseases. So we're currently studying um, cardio cardiometabolic diseases, so diabetes, obesity, hypertension, stuff like that. Um, clinical interests, I'm not quite sure yet. It's still pretty early. I really like adult-based medicine, so I'm thinking some sort of area in internal medicine, but I haven't quite narrowed it down yet. Um, and then long-term career goals, I would love to be able to continue to do this type of research throughout my career. I think it opens a lot of doors to continue to do clinical-based population research. Um, and you can kind of apply it to all different areas of medicine, so I'm really excited about it. And then other passions, I'm big runner. Um, I just signed up for the Milwaukee Marathon, which is in April. I'm crossing my fingers that it'll happen, but if it's virtual, I will probably have to do the same thing as Joe did. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but um, otherwise, I do have a dog as well, and I'm absolutely obsessed with her. Uh, you will see her all over my Twitter feed. And then uh, since the beginning of quarantine, I've picked up interior decorating. So that is pretty much me right now. Awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Um, the next person is Juliana. Hi, guys. I'm Juliana. Um, my hometown would be Burridge, Illinois, so southwestern suburbs of Chicago. My undergraduate institution was UIC, so I am homegrown. I decided that I uh, am a little crazy, and instead of, you know, going somewhere else, I decided to double up and do an eight-year program at UIC. Um, and my major in undergrad was actually neuroscience. So quite a few neuroscience people here. Um, right now I'm an M2, which means I'm in my second year of medical school. So after this year, I will finish um, the book work, take step one, and then join into the PhD phase of the program. Um, for my research interests, and this is actually pre-COVID, but um, my, pre my research interests were actually respiratory viruses and vaccine development. So pre-COVID, I actually worked on making um, lipid nanoparticle mRNA vaccines, which is pretty cool because that's what they're using for the COVID vaccines. So um, that would be my research interests, my clinical interests. Um, I like allergy and inflammation. Um, so anything I can do to access tissue that's easy to obtain. So right now, uh, ENT is looking very attractive to me because it's very easy to obtain nasal tissue um, and also infect it with viruses. Um, and also I like it because within the nasal epithelial, you have the olfactory nerve, which, can go, which you know, has little nerve endings that go through the cribriform plate and access the brain. So I like it that it kind of combines my interest in um, virology and uh, neuroscience. So long-term career goals, I feel like I'm still new in the whole program and I feel like I just definitely need more exposure to things um, before I really have a good idea. Um, but definitely I would like to have some form of combination of research and medicine. Um, passions. Um, I got a dog. She's right here. Let's see. Uh, can you see her? Oh, she's right there. She's actually in a cat bed right now. Um, I don't know why. That, that's actually her toy box, but instead she just sleeps in a cat bed. She likes it. But um, so that's my dog. And then um, hobbies. I 
try to have hobbies, but it's hard in medical school. Um, but I like to paint. That tends to be what I do when I have free time. And I think that's about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Juliana. You, you're, we're, you're, we're sensing a trend with dogs here. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least is Reggie. Hi, can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Reggie. Um, I'm from Ohio. I'm from like Northeast Ohio, Cleveland area. Um, I went to undergrad in Ohio at The Ohio State University, where I studied microbiology um, and did a little bit of chemistry too. Um, I'm currently a first year medical student in the program. So I am a baby in the program. Uh, super fun. <laughs> um, in terms of research interests, uh, microbiology and immunology specifically um, are two areas that I will probably be studying in my graduate years. Um, in terms of clinical interests, I'm really interested in dermatology. I love skin. I love skin care. Uh, so um, that's what interests me right now. We'll see. I have a long ways to go. Um, in terms of long-term career goals, um, I want to be a clinician, obviously. I'm not sure if I want to have my own lab and, and do research in that way, or if I want to do some sort of um, like more writing and, and research or like journal, like, like being in charge of a journal, some sort of thing like that. I'm not really sure if I want to have my own lab, but we'll see. Long way to go. Um, in terms of other passions, I already said I like skincare. I watch like every skincare dermatologist on YouTube and I learn about like product science. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, and then also just like working out. Um, big fan of Peloton, if you guys have. Uh, and yeah, and studying because that's what you do as a first year medical student. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Reggie. And thank you, everybody. So hopefully this gives you kind of an idea of kind of the all the different um, research interests, clinical interests, where our students are coming from, what our long term career goals are. And we're definitely going to have plenty of time to talk more about them. And you can ask um, very broad questions, very specific questions. If there are questions that come up throughout this, you can feel free to add them into the chat. And we'll, one of our students can respond to you within the chat or once we're done at the end, we can also kind of have a group response to it as well. Um, so with that in mind, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what is it, what is a physician scientist? What is an MD, PhD? Why would you want to get it? Um, and give you a little bit of information into in terms of helping you kind of make a decision about one, what are these programs are, are like? Do I have to do an MD PhD program? What are some other options that are available to me? And then also another thing is even if you're not interested in MD PhD training, how as an undergraduate, post back or master's student, could you start to seek out opportunities to get involved in clinical work, research, so on and so forth? So I wanted to start uh, with this slide here, which is what is a physician scientist? And this is, um, I, I wanted to start with this because this was a question that I really didn't know the answer to for most of my time, if not all of my time in college. And so physician scientists are a specific subtype of physicians who choose to engage in biomedical research as a substantial component of their practice. Does that have to be 90%? No, it could be 10%, it could be 50%, it could be 80%. And one of the themes that you'll hear me talk about is flexibility with career options as a physician scientist. You can have an 80-20, a 70-30, a 50-50 type of practice between your clinical care of patients and research. Um, the goal is to better understand and treat human disease, and they tend to play a critical role in translational medicine, clinical research, uh, clinical trials, and really connecting basic science research from the bench all the way to the bedside of the patient. And I just listed, I put five pictures here. Um, I think at, you'll, everyone will recognize at least one or two of these individuals, but these are some prominent physician scientists. And so let's just kind of walk 
walk through some of who they are. So Francis Collins is currently the director of the NIH. His claim to fame was leading the Human Genome Project, which first sequenced the entire human genome almost a decade ago. Um, here on the top right is Nancy Andrews. She's a physician scientist who served as the first uh, woman dean of medicine for an entire college of medicine in the, in the United States. Um, and she's on the board of directors for several national academies of science and medicine. Here on the bottom left is Mae Jemison. She is actually kind of like a triple threat. She's a physician, a scientist, and as you can see here, an astronaut. So she was one of the first physicians and scientists to travel into space, and her PhD training was in chemical engineering. Um, in the bottom middle, most people these days will know is Dr. Anthony Fauci, who um, works at the National Institute of Infectious Disease. Um, and is currently serving as uh, one of the top medical advisors for the COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally here on the bottom right is, is um, one of my favorite scientists. This is uh, Benjamin Barras. He is, um, was the father of uh, glial biology within neuroscience. So studying cells in the brain that are not neurons and, and what do they do and how do they contribute to neurodegenerative and neurologic diseases. He's also the first transgender uh, um, scientist ever elected to the academy, uh, National Academy. Um, and so these are just some of the, the great examples of some physician scientists that have made incredible contributions to our understanding of health and disease. There are a lot of different types of ND PhD programs out there. In the United States alone, currently, there's about 123 MD PhD programs. Um, and 50 of those are actually supported through a governmental funding mechanism through the National Institutes of Health or NIH. And 50 of those programs um, are sponsored by the NIH and those receive a designation known as MSTP or Medical Scientist Training Program. UIC is actually one of those 50 and you can see here in the map to the right, these are the 50 MSTP programs throughout the country, um, but there are plenty of other non-MSTP MD-PhD programs that you could look into and learn more about as well. Um, the MSTP program through the NIH, in addition to the 50 different institutions that are competitively funded, um, they cover over a thousand trainees. Uh, which is a good number of people to ensure this physician scientist pipeline to really connect basic science research to the care of patients. One of the cool things about MD-PhD and one of the reasons that I was really interested in this type of training was the flexible career pathways that it can afford. Um, they're really uh, endless opportunities for where you can take your career um, and it can involve one if not several different things all at once. So uh, the most common pathway is going into academia. So most MD-PhD graduates go on to become faculty at medical schools or university hospitals. And this often involves a blend of seeing patients, whether it's in a clinic, in the hospital, in the operating room, running a lab, or in being involved in some type of research, whether it's a clinical trial with patients or animal models or molecular studies. Um, teaching and educating medical students, graduate students, residents, and fellows, and sometimes administrative duties, serving as the deans of the College of Medicine. Our actual dean of the University of Illinois is an MD-PhD ophthalmologist, and he also serves as the director of our MSTP program. Another opportunity is, is working for the government. So you can work for something like the NIH, like Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci. Um, other examples would be the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, one of the several national research labs, so on and so forth. Industry, working for various pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, um, as well as private practice. And this is actually from a study that was released in 2015 showing where um, uh, it's a little, it's five years old at this point, although they did release a new study uh, more recently. Um, but from this 2015 study showing you the breakdown of where MD-PhD graduates end up. And you can see it's really, um, the majority are in academia, but really you can go anywhere. Some go into consulting, law and finance, work for federal agencies, research institutes, the NIH, and much more. Now, the big thing to know about the MD-PhD uh, training is the timeline. And so by and large, um, the MD-PhD training in general 
tends to last anywhere from seven to 10 years, depending on the program. Um, medical school is traditionally four years long and graduate school across the country can range anywhere from three to six years. Now here at UIC, our graduate training is three to five years, depending on your particular project, your mentor, your prior experiences and so on and so forth. Um, so our program overall tends to be somewhere between seven to nine years. Um, however, um, across the country, it's really anywhere from seven to 10. Um, so what you would do is you would start out just like Reggie and Juliana and start in your M1 and M2 years and do your first two years of medical school. This is the time where you're engaging in all of your medical school coursework. So you're taking learning things like anatomy in the anatomy cadaver lab, physiology, biochemistry, pathology, pharmacology, microbiology. And oftentimes you're blending this in learning it in organ system based fashion. So you're taking, um, yes, it will be recorded. Feel free to email me if you need a copy of the recording as well. Um, you can blend all of these things into, let's say you're doing your nervous system block, your brain and behavior block, you're covering the anatomy, the physiology, the pharmacology, that's all relevant to the nervous system. Once you finish your M2 year during this time, you'll do various lab rotations, figure out what department, what program, and what advisor you want for your PhD training, and then you'll begin your PhD training. The first year or two is going to be some coursework as well as your laboratory work, and the later years are entirely mostly laboratory work prior to defending your dissertation. Once you defend your PhD, you'll return to graduate school just like I'm about to do and Corey did last year, and then you'll go into your third year of medical school where you do various rotations through the hospital through specialties such as internal medicine, uh, surgery, OBGYN, pediatric, psychiatry, family medicine, and internal medicine. And then you'll decide this is this, and you'll have time to do electives for other um, specialties like anesthesiology, ear, nose, and throat, dermatology. And then once you make a decision about what you want to go into, your fourth year of medical school really focuses in and allows you to do additional rotations in those specialty of interest and related specialties. So it is a long training and given the length of time, um, there is a significant uh, financial support for MD PhD trainees. So most programs throughout the country, especially all of the MSTP programs will actually provide you with a full tuition scholarship for the entire length of your training. So what that means is that for both medical school and graduate school, you would be paying zero tuition. Um, and oftentimes all of your student fees and stuff like that are also covered. So it's an incredible investment, um, both from the federal government and from a college of medicine to train you as a physician scientist. On top of receiving that full tuition scholarship, you also get a competitive monthly stipend. Now this varies slightly depending on where you live in the country based off of cost of living, but can range anywhere from 26 to $35,000 a year on top of the full tuition and fee waiver. And like I said, the amount and length of support may vary based on institutions. So that's something that you'd have to um, check into on individual program websites. But many uh, programs, in addition to this level of support, will also support trainees to travel and present at scientific conferences. Our program here at UIC um, actually offers a $500 travel stipend per conference for any conference that any of our students want to attend. On top of all of this, um, trainees can actually apply for independent fellowship and pre-doctoral awards from things like the National Institute of Health or NIH, these are the F30 or F31 grants, or other external sources. Um, a lot of times these other sources come from things like research foundations such as the American Heart Association, the American Epilepsy Society, so on and so forth. And this can actually provide you with additional funding, not only to conduct your research, buy the necessary equipment and reagents, but buy office supplies, get yourself a nice computer, um, as well as support yourself in terms of traveling and being able to present your research throughout not only the country, but throughout the world. So turning a little bit now, um, that was kind of an overview of MD-PhD training. And now I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about the University of Illinois College of Medicine and our MSTP program. Um, so the University of Illinois College of Medicine, um, these are just some interesting facts, are, is one of three Illinois medical schools with a Carnegie Foundation Highest Research Activity or R1 category university. On top of that, it's actually one of five medical schools in the United States that's both a Carnegie R1 category university and ranked among the top 50 colleges and universities on the social mobility index. 
Um, in a 2010 study, UIC was ranked in the top 20 for the social mission of medical education, ranking the schools. We're one of nine US medical schools in the country located on a campus with a full complement of other health profession schools. So this is a great opportunity for collaboration and interprofessional education as we're right next to the colleges of dentistry, physical therapy, nutrition, so on and so forth. UIC is the alma mater of one in six physicians that are currently practicing in the state of Illinois and two thirds of the African American, Latino and Latina and Native American physicians practicing in Illinois. We're also the largest contributor among US medical schools to the increase in Latino and Latina physicians over the last few decades. So zooming a little bit in now into the MSTP program at UIC, we currently are a very large program and have 90, almost 100 students, 94 students. Um, and that's roughly split evenly between those who are in their medical school phase of training and their graduate school phase of training. Since I started this program in 2014, there's been this exponential growth in our program and our size has actually almost doubled. Um, we have a very diverse student body coming from institutions across the country. Um, and about half of them are from either Illinois or the Midwest, but the other half are from any other state throughout the country. Uh, each year we receive anywhere from three to 400 applications for a total of about 15 positions that are funded by the NIH each year. And we're really excited because the NIH uh, keeps increasing the amount of funding that they've given us over the last couple of years. And they recently renewed our training grant in 2017 for an additional 10 years. The average time to degree within our program is 7.9 years. And the PhD duration for our students varies from anywhere from three to five years. So our program offers integrated MD and PhD training with sequential periods of emphasis. And this is in a classic 242 model. So you do the two years of medical school, an average of four years of PhD training, and then you refer you return for your last two years of medical school. During your early years, like Reggie and Juliana and your M1 and M2 year, you'll conduct anywhere from two to four lab rotations in whatever department you choose um, to identify your PhD mentors. Um, during this time, for all of our students in the program, we also have monthly lunch and dinner seminars where we bring in physician scientist speakers, either on campus or from anywhere throughout the country or the world, to speak to our students and learn about career development and networking, as well as the science that they're doing. We have one-on-one -on -one advising with program leaders. Um, we have a house advising system where each of our students is uh, sorted into one of four houses that are named after all of the four uh, DNA nucleotides. So thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. And once we get sorted into those houses, we have a whole host of social events and advising networks that you can establish. During your graduate uh, training, we have clinical connections where you're uh, still maintaining some uh, time in the clinic, in the hospital, seeing patients. Oftentimes that's very relevant or directly related to what you're studying in your PhD. We have annual retreats where we all get together and share our work, um, kind of networking and get together as a program. And like I said, a competitive stipend and a full tuition and fee waiver for the entire length of your training. These are the PhD uh, training programs of current students uh, in uh, the UIC MSTP program. So here you can see a pie chart to the right if you can look and see kind of your favorite scientific discipline there. Um, there's been a little bit of reorganization of the, within the graduate college in the last couple of years. And now uh, many of these actually fall under this umbrella program known as the Graduate Education in Medical Sciences program, where you would have a PhD in biomedical sciences with a research concentration in any of the fields listed here. So those can include cancer biology, cell biology and regenerative medicine, integrative translational physiology, microbiology, immunity and inflammation, molecular and structural biology, as well as neurobiology. We also have, and, and currently this is one of the more popular PhD programs that uh, Corey and I both, uh, well, Corey was in and I'm currently in, uh, and that's the Umbrella Graduate Program within in Neuroscience. So this is a multidisciplinary program that brings together people from chemistry, physics, engineering, philosophy, psychology, psychiatry, neurology, physiology, all under the umbrella of studying neuroscience. Uh, we have bioengineering and bioinformatics degrees several uh, degrees within pharmaceutical sciences, including medicinal chemistry, 
um, public health, epidemiology, and biostatistics PhD programs, and several others, including things in oral sciences, health policy and administration, and more. So where do our students ultimately go? Um, this is data from uh, 2006 to 2020. And what I'm showing you here is the graduates of our program, what specialties they go into. And what you can see here is pretty much any specialty that you're interested in is possible as an MD PhD student. And many residency programs actually view MD PhD students very highly, um, given the translational nature of our training and our ability to not only contribute to patient care, but also to research endeavors. Students have an opportunity to choose between traditional medical residencies as well as research focused residencies. Um, and we've had very strong uh, match outcomes for our students. And for the last two years, all of our students have matched into one of their top ranked programs. And we're currently looking into long term outcomes of our graduates in terms of how many of our graduates go on to become faculty in academia, how many go into private practice, work in industry, work for the government, have faculty positions or in grant or NIH funded labs. A couple other things to just talk about before we open up the, the Q and A. Um, some other program outcomes that are really interesting is that 60% uh, of our students receive additional independent support um, grants or fellowships from the NIH or other external organizations during their training. We have a really strong alumni involvement in the program. Each year we bring back one of our prominent um, alumni who is uh, a faculty at some institution throughout the country to give us a kind of a talk about their research, their career trajectory. And we're also working on more recent alumni panels to bring back people who are currently in their residency to talk about how it prepared them. Finally, um, we've been really fortunate to inc in receive increased funding and recognition, not only from the NIH, but from the College of Medicine as well. Now that's all the curriculum and the outcomes and stuff, but I, I think perhaps the two most important slides that I have to show are showing you how many other things that you are possible as an MD PhD student. The nice thing about being in an MD PhD uh, program is that during that length of time, you actually have a lot of flexibility to explore other hobbies and other passions. And so some of the images I'm showing you here on the top left, this is uh, some of our MD PhD students uh, volunteering in a medical tent at the Chicago Marathon. Um, Corey uh, each year organizes an annual uh, mud run uh, to raise money for multiple sclerosis and participate in the muck fest. Uh, this is one of our students, Hannah Pennington, uh, kind of showing off her acrobatic skills. Uh, Maggie and I, as well as several other students participating in the rock and roll half marathon. Two of our student leaders uh, at a conference where they are working on healthcare policy, uh, presenting uh, research in medical education and scholarship, competing in triathlons, or really just getting together and having a great time amongst our students. MD PhD students are, have a great opportunity to take on leadership and other roles within the healthcare system and within the university system. And one of the things that is really great about this type of training and the length of time that you have is really the sense of community that gets built amongst students across all years of training. So you're here for seven to nine years. These people really become your family. And you can see some of the uh, pictures here of some of the events that we've done over the years. Finally, this is the last slide where I'll be talking at you. Um, and I just wanted to show you that there's a lot of resources out there where you can learn many, uh, much more about MD PhD training. Um, so one, any undergraduate, post -bac, uh high school student, master's student can actually join the American Physician Scientists Association. Um, and they have high, uh, um, thanks Corey, high yield slide, uh, annual and regional meetings, advocacy and mentorship opportunities. You can actually sign up to get assigned an MD PhD student mentor from anywhere throughout the country. Um, and I listed the website there, but if you just Google American Physician Scientists Association, you can find it there. The AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, this is uh, what administers the crazy things like the MCAT. Um, uh, they actually have a whole uh, series of web pages on MD PhD training, and I listed that website there as well. And then finally, you can definitely be on the lookout for additional panels. 
um, that we're going to be hosting over the next several uh, months and years, as well as uh, what we're hoping to unveil in the early spring 2021, which is an MD PhD mentorship program from our students. And then finally, you can follow any of us individually on Twitter or Instagram, um, but we, our program also has uh, Twitter and Instagram pages where we kind of highlight some of the exciting things going on with our student body. And that's the UIC MSTP Twitter and Instagram pages. Um, and we have a question here. Do some students go straight to academia instead of doing residency and fellowship? Um, most people, I would say like 99% will do a residency first. Fellowship is definitely optional, but in order to practice in the United States, you do have to complete a residency. Um, and it's just another form of postgraduate training uh, that pretty much all faculty positions, if you wanna practice medicine, you would have to do. Now, if you were not interested in practicing medicine after you graduated, which some of our students want, are solely interested in running a research lab, but they felt that the clinical training would really guide their ability to conduct great research, um, those students can actually go on to do a more traditional postdoctoral fellowship in a research lab and then go on to become faculty. Although that's definitely uh, more rare. Most of our students will go on to residency first and then go on to faculty positions. Okay, so I just spent a lot of time um, talking and I wanna now kind of open it up to our panelists. Um, and so we'll maybe we'll go in reverse order this time and we have some moderated questions uh, for our students and that I received in advance and then we'll after five of these we'll open up for an open Q&A from any of our participants. So um, the first question that we had is why did you specifically choose to apply to an MD PhD program and we're going to go in reverse order here because I want to make sure that not the same person's not always going last. So uh, Reggie, if you want to start with this one, uh, it's all you. Yeah, um, so for me, when I started undergrad, I knew I wanted to go to medical school. Um, but even that for me was like something that I didn't really understand uh, how to do because uh, I'm first gen. And so uh, just in like exploring research and doing the things that pre-medical students do, research volunteer shadowing, um, I fell into a research fellowship with the MD PhD who studied um, like neonatal respiratory viruses. And he was like, I think you should be an MD PhD. And I was like, oh, maybe I should. Um, and so I actually took a year off of undergrad uh, to kind of spend a full year like in the lab or in a lab, like doing a lot of research and making sure that that was what I really wanted. Uh, and it turns out that it was, and that's what prompted me to decide to MD PhD programs and here I am now. So uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome, thanks Reggie. Um, next up is Juliana. Boy, um, sounds like I'm interviewing again. Um, <laughs> So why did I choose no to apply to an, yeah why why did I choose to apply to an MD PhD program? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I am a UIC undergraduate, and I imagine many people here are UIC undergraduates. So if you are, I kind of speak to you guys. I actually originally applied just MD, and that is because I thought I wasn't good enough to be an MD PhD, um, and it actually was Patricia Finn who kind of pulled me aside and was like, why didn't you apply MD PhD? Um, and I told her that reason and I learned a valuable lesson. I think everyone should learn, which is even if you don't feel that way, you are good enough. Um, so if you ever need a motivational talk, just you know, email me um, and we can have a chat. But in reality, I chose to apply to an MD PhD program because it kind of answers the calling of that I love research and medicine, and not just kind of, you know, figuratively mopping up the floor, but also figuring out why the water's there in the first place, and really try to solve problems, rather than just trying to treat problems that when they arise. So I guess if I were to sum up in a nutshell, that's how I'm here. Awesome. Thanks, Juliana. Next up is Maggie. So um, I had a similar experience to Juliana where I actually applied primarily MD, mostly just because I didn't know that MD PhD programs really existed. Um, my school, I went to Loyola on the north side of Chicago and they really wasn't much discussion on what MD PhD programs were like or what 
even a career as a physician scientist was, even though we were a very pre-health oriented school. And so it wasn't until I had already submit, I already applied. And I had the same experience where people were like, why didn't you do this? And so I actually went back into my application and I clicked a couple extra boxes. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll do an extra essay or two. And I applied to a handful of extra schools and it um, worked out to that. I had a lot of research experiences and I knew that I wanted to do academia. I didn't know that I wanted to do all research, but I knew that academics was really the career choice that I was looking for. And so it's kind of how I ended up here. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, so I, I, I first got, uh, you know, MD, PhD programs on my radar when um, I was doing my master's uh, so I, I, I did a master's in uh, chemical engineering, same, same thing, uh, because I started doing uh, research as an undergrad and I just really, really enjoyed it. Like that was, that became like my favorite thing about school was doing research um, and being able to tie chemical engineering to biological research. Uh, and I was taking a course in nanomedicine uh, in my master's and there was a figure that really stuck to me uh, when uh, the professor was showing us the increases in efficacy of cancer treatments since like the 1920s and it was such a minuscule increase um, and I, I had always known that I, I wanted to go to medical school uh, you know I, I had known that for a long time and I think there really stuck to me that uh, as far as medicine has come uh, we still have a lot to do. Uh, and even though like I'm, I'm not particularly interested in cancer research, it really just opened my eyes to um, the possibility of being able to bring like my uh, engineering background into medicine. And uh, that's, that's when I decided that that was the way I had to go. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, next up is Corey. Man, I love this question. Um, it's just, it's fun looking backwards while I'm at the end of this. Um, but for me, I grew up with, my mom was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis um, when I was three years old. So I grew up being a caregiver and my mom, and I mean, my dad was a primary care physician. So I got to see both sides of the coin. My dad working his butt off as a family medicine doc and my mom not being able really to get any treatment for her disease, despite them knowing what it was. So that was a huge inspiration for me, but much like a lot of the other people on the panel have said, I didn't realize MD PhD was a thing. So my institution was not very like pre-health or pre-medicine focused. So I had to get a lot of outside input onto how to even get in and do the application process for medical school. And one of the major things that people told me was that I had to stack my CV and I had to get research experience. So I was like, oh man, they don't have that at my school. How am I going to do this? I applied to like, I forget the number. I used to know this was one of my favorite things to recite at the interviews, but like 40 or something lab positions um, after I graduated undergrad to try and get some of that like much needed research experience under my belt. I was lucky enough to get into a lab and what was going to be one year off to like get my feet back under me, you know, like live the life of not being in debt and like making money turned into three because I loved research so much. So I was lucky enough in that time to meet an MD PhD who encouraged me to apply as well. So we're hoping that this panel can serve to fill that gap that it sounds like many of us had, which was that we didn't know it was a thing. So, but could, I couldn't be happier that I ended up pursuing it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, and, and my story is very similar. I actually, when I was in high school, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and my parents said that's because I, I argued with them all the time. Um, and, but what happened was after taking some AP classes and, and uh, really finding that I loved biology and chemistry, I went on to college to be a biochem major. And I said, you know what, I'm going to be pre-med. Um, and just like every other pre-med student here is they say, hey, you know, in order to be competitive for med school, you have to do research. So I was like, oh, okay, fine. Um, so I was like, well, I just took, uh, surprisingly, I liked organic chemistry and I just finished that class my sophomore year. And I asked my professor, hey, can I work in your lab? 
Um, and uh, she was like, yeah, sure. And so I started working in her lab and she mentored me and gave me a lot of help. And that ended up uh, expanding into a project where the chemicals, the organic molecules that I was uh, synthesizing and characterizing, we were actually able to apply them in both a cancer biology and immunology setting. So I started to get more biomedical research and I was like, wow, I actually kind of like this, but yeah, I'm going to med school. Um, and then one of my pre-med advisors was like, this is my junior year, was like, have you heard of MD PhD programs? And I was like, no. Um, but one of my other huge passions, if, if you'll hear me talk about this a lot, is actually education. So I've been very much involved in um, teaching and education, both of college students, but also lately medical students um, and stuff like that, and have been involved in some kind of national education initiatives for medical training. Um, and I knew that an MD PhD program, in addition to uh, allowing me to pursue my medical degree, um, not give up that intrigue and interest I had in science and research, but also prepare me for a career in academia. Um, and that was really what all kind of came together to inspire me to apply to these types of programs. All right, our next question um, is, how did you seek out research opportunities as an undergraduate uh, student? So let's start with Nathan. Sorry, I'm gonna just randomly order now. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I got interested in, well, I got interested in research uh, a lot of the ways some of us did where uh, we knew we were pre-med, kind of want to do some research. Um, and I got lucky in that um, I just had a meeting with, uh, with like my faculty advisor uh, from, from when I was an undergrad. And I told him, I was like, hey, look, like I want to do research. I don't know anything about this. What do I do? Um, he gave me some advice, which was to find, uh, find professors whose work interested me. Uh, and, you know, it's simple enough. You look through department websites, you see their names, you look them up, uh, you kind of can read some abstracts on their publications, uh, and then send them an email and uh, talk about why you're interested and, you know, if they're willing to take on a, an undergraduate student. Um, and so I, I did that with a few labs. Uh, and then it turned out that the lab that really interested me was my faculty advisor's lab. Uh, so I came back to him a few weeks later and I was like, hey, uh, can I actually join your lab? I'd like to learn, you know, how to do some of the things that uh, you're doing here. And that was, that was how I got my research opportunity. And uh, I think something to keep in mind for everyone here is especially if, if you're an undergrad and if you know if you're past that stage that's okay but as an undergrad you're basically free labor to uh to these groups and so you'll find someone who's willing to take you on awesome those are good points um let's go to corey next Cool. So as I mentioned, my school didn't really have opportunities for me. So I had to go externally. And that was definitely like a bit of a bear of a process. But I essentially just looked at multiple different universities around me to see um, who had like postings for lab positions. And then I went also because I knew I was interested in neuroscience research. I reached out to neurology departments and people who I thought I would be interested in their research. And I did a ton of interviews. Um, the other thing I would say too is from my experience as a PhD student with undergrad students under me, there's also a ton of opportunity for you to get paid to do research as well with um, different grants that you can apply for and things like that. So um, yeah, mine, mine is a little bit choppy, but that's what I got. Thanks, Corey. Um, let's go to Juliana next. Hi, um, well, I didn't know so many of us like organic chemistry, but I did it well. Um, so it was actually, I was went to office hours to my organic chemistry at UIC. Um, and I just asked him a question and he said, that's a very good question. Do you want to join my research lab? Um, and so then I did because I liked it. And then when I joined his lab, I realized that everything you learn in organic chemistry is kind of a lie because we have much better reactions for a lot of the things you learn in that class because um, you learn chemistry from like you know 80 years ago um, and so in that lab I made antibiotics but similar to tetracycline if you know it 
Um, and from there, I kind of came to the conclusion that although it was cool, I kind of felt like Breaking Bad in the lab, um, you know, making these drugs. I realized that just making new antibiotics is not really the solution to the growing epidemic of antibiotic resistance. And so then I wanted to learn more about it. And so I actually applied to an email I got at UIC from the Finn Perkins lab looking for undergraduates to join their lab. And the rest is kind of history. I joined their lab and I didn't know about MD PhD programs at UIC, believe it or not, but here I am. Um, and then the Finn Perkins lab, they had multiple MD PhDs in that lab, which was a blessing and a curse for me because I realized how competitive it was because they told me, you know, what they had before they applied, which made me feel like I wasn't good enough. Um, but also it was a blessing because, you know, they also convinced me I was good enough and ended up applying to the program and here I am. So that probably sums up my research opportunities as an undergraduate. I basically rotated through two labs. Awesome. Uh, next up, let's go with Reggie. Yeah, so um, I kind of have a, like an interesting story and I just remembered it, but I kind of retired it after I was done interviewing. But in undergrad, research was like something that was like very daunting to me because I was like, basic science just feels very scary, although I was a microbiology major. So I actually started off doing public health research. Um, and I like to describe it as like every year of my college experience, I like moved closer and closer to basic science research. So I started off doing like public health work and I like went abroad and I did some stuff there. And then the next year I like did like clinical research. Um, and that was really cool. And then the year after that is when I like met the MD PhD and I was doing basic science research and I was like, oh wait, this is like super cool. Um, but in that, like I'll say, I think the main thing that is just to like follow your passions and like don't do research that you don't wanna do or you're not interested in. Um, and that's, and by doing that, that's kind of how I got to so many experiences. I feel like when I was an undergrad, everyone just wanted to be in a research lab and so many people like hated what they were doing or didn't like the people who they were working with. But for me, I was like always so happy and I was like able to like go live in another country for free and like do all these cool things and travel and do stuff because I was like interested and I was passionate and I don't know, I kind of just like followed what felt right to me. So, you know, like if you don't really know if you wanna do basic science research, like there are ways to work into that, right? Like you can expose yourself to clinical research um, the, through the same way that people on the panel have been saying, like reaching out to people or using your networks, using your advisors, because those are the people who know the scientists and, and other people who are like looking for help. So, yeah. Awesome, um, Maggie? Um, so, in undergrad, my so my best advice for both undergraduate students or any if you're at any phase kind of in your education is you want to find both a research lab, but you also want to find a mentor, like someone that can kind of help you in your career, that gives good advice, that cares about you and is going to hopefully also write you a good letter. So when you do want to go to that next phase in your career, so you don't want to just pick a lab just to do research. Um, don't check it off just like it's another box on your CV, like you want to get to know your mentor. You, so my best advice is to start off with the people that you know. So I had a really good relationship with one of my Gen Chem professors. I would go to his office hours. I really enjoyed his company. And I was like, you know what, would you want to, I really didn't care about his research at all. I was like, well, I'll work in your lab and we'll see how this goes. And he actually, because he knew who I was and like what I was interested in, actually adjusted his project to meet my expectations. And so I hate bench research, absolutely hate it. And that is why I'm doing my PhD in public health. And he actually is a, is a chemistry lab and was able to adjust his lab to be doing dry lab material and computational stuff for me. And that's kind of how I would recommend getting involved in research at your institution, but other ways is if you are in the Chicago area. So I also worked at um, Argonne National Labs. You can apply for external research opportunities. And so especially if you're interested in getting paid for the work that you do. Um, so Argonne National Lab, any of the other like national laboratories in the area, they have a lot of really good research. You can look at some of their undergraduate programs. And then also um, the National Science Foundation has what REUs 
And those are really great to apply for as well. If you just want to apply broadly, if you're interested in short-term work and you just kind of want to get your feet wet and see what research is like, um, that's another recommendation that I have for just like trying different things. Awesome, that's so helpful. And uh, I, I guess from my kind of perspective, I did the same thing. I started with the professors that I knew. I liked my organic chemistry professor. I asked her if I could join the lab. I did organic chemistry research for a year. And then I realized uh, kind of like other people, I was like, I want to do something that's more medically relevant. Um, and I told her that and she was like, okay, what other professors do you know on campus? And I had actually just taken uh, cancer biology and immunology, two courses with another professor. And I was like, well, I know Dr. O'Donnell. And she was like, let's go talk to him. So we set up a meeting and we ended up developing like a collaborative project where the chemicals that I was making in the lab and characterizing, we were able to actually test their anti-cancer effects and their anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and so really it, it does come down to just reaching out to people and I know it's uncomfortable sometimes, but just sending an email or going to a talk and then asking a question at the end, maybe stay, staying back a little bit once we're back in person or even on Zoom um, and seeing, you know, do you have a spot in the lab? Do you know people who do similar work? Um, over the last five years that I've do, done my PhD in neuroscience, I've actually worked with, I think it's almost like 10 undergraduate students at this point. Um, and I have four or five right now. And a lot of them I met just because they reached out to me. Um, and you don't always even just have to reach out to a, a, a faculty, you could reach out to graduate students and ask them as well. Um, and I was happy to take on four or five, six students over the last several years. And it's one of the best things too, because they learn a lot, I learn a lot from them. Um, and they can go on your papers, they can, you can have them do posters and stuff like that. So these are just great opportunities to really learn what research is all about. So our next question is very similar, but we're kind of switching gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about clinical opportunities um, prior to uh, medical school or MD PhD programs. And I'll actually start with this one. So uh, when I applied to MD PhD programs, I actually had very little uh, clinical experience. Um, and that is okay. Um, you definitely want some clinical experience. So I had shadowed a neurologist a little bit um, and I had been involved in our like pre-medical fraternity. Um, and um, I spent uh, one semester on our like EMT service on campus, um, but that was it. Um, so it was like one semester of the EMT stuff, this medical fraternity, and then like a week of shadowing. And that was it. Um, I definitely focused more on research, but if I could go back, I definitely maybe would have been a little bit more brave to reach out to physicians that were at the local medical school nearby where I went to college and just ask, hey, I'm really interested in medicine, in neurology and emergency medicine. Um, is there some way that I can uh, shadow you or learn about what you're doing and, and really get that type of experience. Now, with COVID going on right now, that's definitely challenging. Um, and I will tell you, I spoke with our, uh, our program director today and, they, and I asked them, you know, what about the limited clinical opportunities that exist right now? And they said that they're definitely taking all of that into consideration when they review potential applications that right now it's harder to get into the clinical environment, but there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer for example, to help with COVID testing, to help with temperature screening, to be involved in, in research related to COVID and the pandemic. Um, so there are other ways to volunteer, even if it's uh, not particularly, you know, in a hospital or in a clinic to be involved in healthcare. And I definitely encourage people to, to kind of look out for those types of opportunities. Um, so I will now turn it over. We'll kind of go in a descending order now. Uh, so let's start with Corey. And by the way, uh, for our panelists, if you feel like your point has already been made, you can just say ditto and, and move on. But if you have something you know you want to say, then feel free to add it in. But I don't want you all to feel like you have to answer every question. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, so for me, I um, the first thing I did was I actually reached out to a lot of different hospitals that were around me. You can just go to their websites and I looked at what their, their like volunteer opportunities were. 
one of the ones that was more meaningful to me that I did, I didn't do for a very long time, but um, I was one of the people that would help families that their pay their fam um, like one of their family members was in the ICU. So I would be the person running between the medical team and the family to try and give them as much updates as I could um, and to kind of like see what else, what other kind of services I could help them with um, in the meantime. So that kind of volunteerism was awesome. There's a ton of opportunities at the Chicago area hospitals where I did mine was in Denver. Um, first place I would look is their websites. They usually have those sorts of things listed. Um, another thing that I didn't do, but I know a lot of my undergraduates that I mentored in the lab did was they were scribes. And that was something that was really helpful to them in terms of getting exposure. Um, so a medical scribe is someone that will essentially take notes for the physician um, to help them with their electronic documenting. Um, so that's another opportunity you can look into. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, so I, I, uh, on the contrary to my research uh, opportunities, which I think came pretty easily, my clinical opportunities were not as easy to come by. Uh, the doctors at my institution uh, never, ever got back to me. So I think the my biggest advice here is to be creative. So like Corey said, you know, volunteering uh, is probably the, the most... Uh, like sure way you're going to get in there. Um, you know, just look at some kind of local hospital and find their volunteer program. So my, my first really major clinical experience was uh, through a volunteer program. Uh, we uh, basically, uh, it was a program with the uh, transplant service uh, where we would just come and uh, just try to encourage the patients to just walk around because uh, a lot of them were pretty debilitated or not feeling well from their surgeries or from other things they had going on. So that was uh, my first uh, real clinical opportunity. And um, that was really towards the very end of my uh, like schooling. And so uh, I also did a year of clinical research after uh, I finished up with school before I joined the program. Uh, and so I, I think that's another, uh, you know, kind of a, I guess you can hit like two birds with one stone on that one. You can get some research and you can also get some clinical opportunity. So I would say also be on the lookout for those. There are actual like paying jobs that you can do for that as, as gap years. Uh, yeah. Awesome, thanks, Nathan. Um, let's turn it over to Maggie. Um, so ditto most of that. I would, the only thing I would add is that um, it's difficult, especially if you're in an area that you're not from and you don't know many people. So that was an issue that I had as I moved from Wisconsin to Chicago and I had no connections. And a lot of people are at a really big advantage if they know physicians that can they can shadow or work with. I would say the most meaningful clinical experiences that I did have prior to medical school were like one contact with a physician and shadowing. The way I did that was actually through my research is I reached out to one of my research advisors who um, I was working with and I asked if they knew any doctors in the area that would be possibly interested and if I could name drop them. Because I emailed, I think, dozens of clinics, dozens of hospitals asking, can I like, can I come in? Can I work? I'll do whatever. And no one responded. Or if they did respond, they'd be like, no. <laughs> and so um, I would say, don't like, don't give up. Don't, for, don't be afraid to use the people that you do know, even if they may not be connected to that field. And also don't be afraid to hate hospital volunteering and stop. Cause I ended up, I volunteered at, I think like St. Francis hospital and it was miserable. I was cleaning and stocking shelves. And I was like, I am not getting anything clinically relevant out of this. I did it for one semester. And I was like, I'm never going back. I didn't even put it on my CV. <laughs> and so yeah, don't be afraid to quit something if it may not be completely relevant to you. That is a really good point. You don't have to do everything. Really just focusing on a few things and doing them well and making sure you're passionate about it is so much more important. Um, let's move on to Juliana. Hi guys. Um, let's see, clinical experiences. Um, I had, I would say more than the average MD PhD. Um, and so I originally was an EMT um, and I did the program at UIC by Marty Walsh, totally recommend it. He's really funny. Um, and I was an EMT in both an ambulance and an ER. And part of the reason why I did that was because I 
didn't have any money. So I like volunteering really wasn't an option for me because I didn't, I couldn't afford the time. And so I was an EMT, but then I kind of came to the realization that as an EMT, I didn't really feel like I would knew what a physician did. Um, and so then I decided to become a scribe. Um, and so then I was both an EMT and a scribe. And that was awesome. And I did that for several years. Um, and I moved up the ranks in Scribe America. And then I soon managed all the scribes in the Chicagoland area across like 25 hospitals. Um, so if you ever, I still have connections to uh, Scribe America. So if you need a job, let me know. And I know some people and can pull strings. Um, so just let me know. I definitely recommend becoming a scribe because knowledge I learned from there but not only about being a physician, but how to chart. It's the same. They teach you how to chart. And in fact, because you're actually doing it and using Epic and using Cerner, you learn how to do it better than they teach you in medical school because they don't teach you how to use Epic or Cerner before your N3 and M4 year. Um, so I totally recommend it and I can pull strings if you need it. So that was probably, I did that for several years. It was great. I loved it. Um, and I think that's all I did. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And so like one of the points too, is just like putting your name out there and even just by attending tonight's panel, you're establishing connections and, and potential networks with us and with your peers that could lead to great opportunities. So don't be afraid to reach out to any of us. Um, next, we're going to go on to Reggie. Yeah, I'll keep it very brief. I, I went to a school that had a large medical school and a large medical center and an associated children's hospital that's also very large. So it wasn't too difficult for me to find anything, but I just wanna echo what Joe said about um, like experiences that are like patient serving that may not be in a hospital because I think those experiences are very important and are very meaningful. So like, if you're like a caretaker of your family member, I know so many people who like put that on medical school applications because that is, you know, you taking care of patients and it's not l learning and understanding what it means to be a physician. But if you can show like you've shadowed a physician so you know what it's like to be in a hospital for at least a few hours and then you have a significant amount of time like in a nursing home or doing something that's like patient serving. I think that shows that you really want to work with people and, and want to pursue clinical medicine. So that's all I wanted to say. Awesome, thanks Reggie. Uh, so we actually had another one of our students um, who is amazing and talented, May Barakat, join us. So I wanna actually give her this opportunity to do a brief introduction and then see if she has anything to add on to seeking out clinical opportunities. Awesome, thank you, Joe. Hi everybody, I'm May, I'm a G3. Uh, so third year grad student, fifth year in the program, which feels kind of crazy. Um, I grew up in a relatively small town in Texas, and then I did my undergrad uh, in human developmental and regenerative biology. And I didn't even know that dual degree programs existed till I was like almost three fourths of the way through college. So whatever position you are in at this moment, if you feel like everyone else is like magically more prepared than you, I promise that's totally okay. And it still works out because I showed up and I like, I, you know, I thought I was real smart coming out of high school and I got to college and got absolutely crushed by everyone around me. And it was a great learning experience. And it is also proof in the pudding that no matter where you start, um, you can do this. So I hope that that will serve as a piece of encouragement. Um, and what I do now, I work in a wound healing lab and all of my research focuses on diabetic ulcers and hopefully eventually uh, topical drug development. So in answer to this clinical experiences question, I think everything everyone has already said is really excellent advice. The only thing that I would add is that I had a couple of courses as an undergrad that were like clinically related. So I got a lot of clinical and patient exposure in those courses that were about like, you know, patient care or uh, pharmaceuticals or like translational medicine. And I think those are kind of rare courses to get to take as an undergrad, which was a really cool experience. But um, I used a lot of those experiences on my applications. And I said, like, you know, I got to study this, this, and this, and meet patients in this, this, and this scenario. Um, I did not have a lot of clinical experience outside of that. Like, I had a little bit of shadowing, like your typical, like, you know, I was in the pre-med society stuff, but like nothing super special. The Most of the stuff on my application was actually 
a little research, more research heavy. Um, and I still feel now five years in that I applied with kind of a lighter resume than most, and it still worked out. Um, I will make one quick plug. I'm sure you guys already talked about this, but um, you'll hear a lot of people say like, are you sure you want to apply MD, PhD? It's so much harder to get in. That's not true. The acceptance rate is basically exactly the same. The pool of people is a lot smaller, but whether you are in the group of the 55,000 who apply to med school or the 1800 who apply MD, PhD, about a third of the applicants get in either way. So like where, whatever your numbers are, whatever your resume looks like, however you're feeling, you're going to hear people tell you that, are you sure? And is it worth it? And it's really hard and you can definitely do it. Like I applied with everything below average numbers and otherwise, and if I can do it, you can do it. So that's my pitch. Um, I won't, I won't go on too much about clinical experience. Cause I think you heard a lot of amazing things from everybody else. Awesome. Thank you so much, May. And welcome. of course, um, so we have two more questions here to go through, and then we're going to open it up for a live Q and a. So, uh, this one I think is a great question because it kind of forces us to all think a little bit of, you know, in retrospect, but also kind of tells you a little bit about, you know, where our minds are at right now. So looking back, what is one thing you would have done differently when preparing to apply for MD PhD programs? Um, and let's go in like reverse year in the program order. So Reggie, I'm going to start with you on this one. Since you are the most recent uh, application for MDP. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I applied like a year ago, not a year ago. Well, I was interviewing a year ago. I applied last summer. So uh, not far removed from it at all. So I was just like, trying to think about how to answer this question. Um, I don't know, for me, I think I told myself short on a lot of things, like in interviews, I was like very shy. So um, I don't think I would change anything about my application or the way that I wrote it or the way that I like presented myself. But I think in terms of interviewing, I would have had more confidence in myself, um, which I don't know if this is answering the question, but um, yeah, cause I don't know, this is, I'm not answering the question. I don't know, this is a hard question. I would say I would have been more confident and I would have like spoken up more in interviews. Cause I think, during MD PhD interviews, they're like very intense and like some are like multi day. And so you have a lot of time to spend at the program. And I just was very quiet at a lot of my interviews and shy. And I wish I would have spoken up more and like got more out of the interview days and showed them a little more of who I was. That's what I'll say. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Juliana. Um, probably knowing about the program and well, I did know about the program, but feeling confident to actually apply to it. <laughs> um, so probably applying it during the normal cycle. I actually changed my application late in, in November, which if anyone knows anything about applying to medical school, changing your application in November is like suicide. <laughs> um, but I did it because honestly, I had a chat with Finn. Um, Dr. Finn, as I said earlier, and she really made me feel like I can do this. And so then I changed all my applications and I actually got a couple of interviews, which was surprising uh, given how late I changed my application. Um, and then I ultimately chose UIC because I couldn't get away from the community and the people. Um, so that's why I'm here. And also I'm here to help promote learning more about the MD PhD to people at UIC that you know, didn't have that opportunity like me when I was an undergrad. Awesome. Let's go to Maggie next. Um, I would just say like learning about MD PhD programs earlier. Um, because it was definitely, I feel like I would have been able to set myself up better if I knew sooner. But otherwise, like don't believe people who are who say like, oh, like you need to learn this before medical school or you need to learn all these different things. Like you Thing you need to know in medical school. I haven't read about it too much. Awesome. Nathan? Yeah, this is a really hard question. Uh, I think mostly because I, I, I think all of us are pretty satisfied with our outcomes. Um, Yeah, I don't have I don't have a good answer for this, so I'm gonna pass. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, it's okay. Um, May. Hi, I love this question. So I want to give like a 10 second backstory. Um, I mentioned already that I was applying knowing going in that like everything I had was below average. 
And my solution to that was to just over apply very aggressively. So everyone sit for a second. I applied to 52 programs, which was insane. It was absolutely insane. Time-wise, emotionally, stress-wise, money-wise, it was truly fundamentally unhinged. However, I say all of that with only two regrets. The first is that I wish I didn't apply to programs I knew I didn't want to go to. When I started applying, I was like, nobody's going to want me. My numbers are trash. I'm just too stubborn to like take some extra years and get my life together. So I'm going to try anyway, because what do I have to lose? The answer to what do I have to lose was thousands of dollars and a lot of emotional stability. But I did not know that at the time. Um, so I was just like, I'm going to throw my hat in every ring in America and just see what happens. And I really wish that I had chosen slightly more carefully because I knew going in that at least 15 of those 52 programs, even if I got an interview, like I really didn't want to go. And I knew that before. And I chose to do it anyway, because I was like, beggars can't be choosers, but you know what? I wasn't as much of a beggar as I thought. And you can be a chooser because it's your life and you should be able to. So I wish that I had had that confidence in the beginning and said, you know what, I'm only going to apply to programs I really feel like I would actually go to. And if I don't get into any of those, then I'll do some more work and apply again. Because subconsciously, I knew even if I did get into one I didn't want, I would have turned it down, done all the work and applied again. So why did I spend the $250 applying and all of the time and effort to do it knowing I didn't want to go. That's my first piece of advice. Second piece of advice is that I wish, this is kind of along the same vein, I wish I had looked into each program more before I decided to apply. And I will add, UIC was in my original top 10 schools. So I could have applied to only 10, all of which I thought were reach programs for me and been fine. So the other 42 applications I did were a waste. Uh, and in the, in the chat, there's a question, did you do all the secondaries? Yes, I did. When I tell you this was insane, it was insane, but I was really stubborn. This is my senior year of college. And I was like, I feel like I got a super late start and I don't want to waste any extra time. Why I thought taking gap years would be a waste of time in that moment. I don't know. I have no reason, no justification then or now why I believe that, but that was my state at the time. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to try now. And worst case scenario, I just end up trying again. And I stand by that sentiment. I feel like if, if you feel ready, take the step, um, as long as you're prepared to invest all of the money and emotion and time and effort that goes into it, knowing you might have to do it all over again. And I knew that upfront. Um, yes, I did do all of that. And I was writing an undergrad thesis and had a full-time job. So I don't know how I survived, to be honest. I think it was just like emotional support from friends that like kept me going and just like a desire to like get it together because I was like, I don't, I don't want to take time off. I don't know why I felt that strongly about it, but I did. Um, so whatever your numbers are, whatever your situation, you can do it. And I strongly encourage you to only put your foot in a door that you actually want to walk through because putting the foot there takes a lot. And if you don't care about the door anyway, save that for something that matters. That's my answer. Awesome. Thanks, May. All right, Corey. Okay. I have a couple of quick things to add. So along the lines of what May said, um, as someone who applied to 12 programs and only got interviews at two, to me, like that was a really good number to put in, but that was still a ton for me. So like that cost me a good chunk of money. I was paying my way through everything. I paid my way through college, all of that. And I was working a full-time job where I was making money. So one of the things I would say is that definitely try and plan to have like a nest egg set aside for when you're applying, but also look into programs and ways that you can get your secondary application fees waived, or you can have, um, there's different ways that you can actually get support for applying to medical school, especially if you're coming from specific backgrounds. So that's one of the things. The other thing um, that I would say is um, 
just kind of to balance off of what May said is that I took those gap years and that was one of the best decisions I've ever made because I was able to pay off a little bit more of my undergraduate student debt. I was also able to like live my life for three years before going into the intensity of medical school. Um, and it also gave me room to not have to take the MCAT during my undergrad, to not have to do the applications during my undergrad, which was something that I don't think I could have been able to, to manage. Um, and that's a very personal decision. Tons of people are able to do it. But that was just me knowing that it took a lot of rigorous focus for me to get through my heavy um, science course load. Um, and then the last thing is that when I was interviewing, much like a lot of the other people have said on this call, I felt just blessed to even be asked to an interview. So I was very much so um, like acting like I was lucky to be there. One of the things that I would recommend that everybody do, whether it's medical school, PhD programs, MD, PhD programs, is you need to be interviewing them just as much as they are interviewing you. Because there are tons of amazing opportunities out there in the world. We only have one life to live and you should be making sure that you're going to an institution that's gonna have your back, that has the opportunities that you want for them, um, for yourself, and that has opportunities to support you to get to your career goals, whatever that might look like, especially if you're not 100% sure. You wanna make sure it has the branches of your interest available to you in case you, you know, one of those branches dies off while you're in training. So um, that's, that's, yeah, it's, don't be afraid. You deserve to be there and you should ask them the questions because you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, I'm going to actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to just tell you guys that we're actually planning another session in January or February and the details will be announced soon. That's uh, focused entirely on applications and applying to MD PhD programs and how to be the best candidate that you can be. Um, so stay tuned for more of that and we'll have plenty of more information, but we definitely wanted to have a little bit of that discussion here. Um, the next question here, I'm actually just going to take this one myself, and then we're going to go to the next and final question and then open up to Q&A. And really, the only reason this question came up is a lot of students feel like they need to choose now what their research is going to be. Um, and the answer is no. My, my research was entirely chemistry, and now I'm doing human and animal model neuroscience. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that point is that what you do your research in as an undergrad, it's more important that you establish great relationships with your mentors and get really good personalized, individualized letters of recommendation, but also that you get skills in research. You actually understand how research works. You have some type of independence. You know what your question is. You know what your hypothesis is. You were able to take on something and learn how to troubleshoot what the obstacles are like. That's way more valuable than saying, you know, I learned all of this neuroscience and that's what I want to do forever. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that question in there. And this is our last kind of moderated question um, that we're going to have. And then I want to open up the last half hour here to a Q&A from any students. Um, and if we can make this one a little bit shorter uh, in terms of your responses, that would be great. Um, and so we can start here. The question is, what has been your favorite experience thus far as an MD PhD student? Um, and we're going to go in descending order here. So Corey, I'm going to actually send this one back to you um, as kind of the, the eldest student uh, besides me in the program. Dude, we're the same. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> um, oh man, this is hard. And guys, I'm so sorry in advance to all the other panelists. I'm totally going to steal your thunder. But like, because this is always the answer people give. I've made like my best friends in my life in medical school. And like the MD PhD program at UIC is like this group of amazing humans that inspire me every day. Um, they push me to be better. Sometimes I can feel a little bit like I'm an imposter, but it's not true. And I know that, and they all lift me up in those moments. And that's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I think that and seeing my own personal growth. When I think of the little 23 year old Corey that y'all saw on that like second slide that entered medical school and I think of who I am now, my professional growth has been like exponential. <laughs> so it's really an amazing opportunity for you to like find yourself and find your professional vocation. Um, so looking backwards, it's seeing the change and the growth that's happened over the years. Awesome. Um, May, you're up next. 
Okay. Um, I actually have two. I think the first is kind of weird, but I love the opportunity that the PhD years have offered me to get more involved with medical students. One of my favorite things to do is like peer support and peer education. And I've, I've been like doing it since I was an undergrad. And I think it's a very unique opportunity to have four extra years of education to be able to like give back to incoming and early med students, which I've loved. And the second is the extra time to really solidify what I'm good at and what I like. And I know if I had been already done with med school by now and gone on to make a career decision, I would have made a different one that I plan to make now having had the extra time to get more involved and try more stuff out. So um, the, the opportunities offered by longevity are my favorite thing, community aside, of course. Awesome, thanks. Um, and Nathan, uh, before you go, I'm seeing people listing their emails and stuff. I am writing those down, so I will make sure that those get out to you. Um, and then again, the best way to kind of uh, hear about this stuff would be to follow our program's Twitter or Instagram account, um, and or even just check out our website. Um, but you can always also always stay in touch with me via email or Twitter or whatever you would prefer. Um, and uh, we'll definitely kind of make sure everybody gets informed. But anyway, back to the question and turning it over to Nathan. So uh, short answer would be uh, our first retreat, uh, a bit of a more long winded answer, which I wouldn't have thought a few six months ago was actually when I was switching labs. Um, I think my favorite part of switching labs is not just that I'm much happier and in a much better lab now, but also uh, the willingness of uh, just all these other students in my program who were who had gone through this or um, who were able to offer me advice and literally with like people that I had spoken to one time for five minutes immediately giving me their cell number to call them immediately um, to talk and figure things out uh, just that that's been that that was the best part. Awesome, Maggie. Um, I just want to second the community aspect of it, and then also just being able to try a bunch of different things. So I did my first research rotation in a wet lab, and affirmed again that I hated it. And so just like you get so many opportunities to kind of decide what you like and what you're good at, and you get an extra four years to do that, including with your, uh, applying that to your medical curriculum and your career choices. So that's probably my favorite thing. Great, Juliana. I really liked the retreat. Uh, we went to Starved Rock and, but we never actually went hiking, which made me mad. So then I made a camping trip for my cohort and we all drove to Wisconsin. And actually one of the pictures in this PowerPoint is from that camping trip. And I feel like that's my favorite memory because it's like, you know, almost my entire cohort of, I don't know how many of us, 12, 13, 13 of us all decided to go camping right after an exam and had s'mores and it was great. Awesome. And Reggie. Um, I'm going to say that I really have enjoyed, um, just like the, what is it, lateral, maybe that's the word, vertical mentorship from the other students in the program. Uh, everyone just being, has been super helpful, especially like with the first year students being 100% online, like due to COVID and like trying to navigate this whole MD, PhD thing. Awesome. So I'll, I'll uh, take the, this question and then we'll turn it over to the open Q&A. Um, so I actually think of, of three experiences um, that have been amazing for me thus far in the seven years that I've been here. And I think each one of them shows you a little bit about why I wanted to be an MD PhD student. Um, the first one is clinical. So at the end of my first year of medical school going into the summer, I applied for this uh, internship program called SEED, uh, and that stands for Surgical Education and Discovery Program. And this was a program that's offered through UIC um, as well as several other schools at this point have one, uh, where basically you do a two week intensive exploration of all of the different surgical specialties. And so you get to go into the OR in the morning, you get to do really cool stuff, you get to do simulations and workshops and career development stuff for all different surgical specialties. And spending those two weeks waking up at 4 
four in the morning was brutal, but it was also exhilarating. Um, and getting into the OR at, by 6 a.m. and being able to actually help suture and staple things was really, really great. Um, so that's the clinical side. On the research side, conferences. Being able to travel and present my work at conferences has been amazing. And I got to go to a Gordon Research Conference on neuroimmunology, where I was able to actually meet the leaders in the field of the intersection between the brain and the immune system. And that was one of the coolest things I've ever done. I learned so much. My like inner little kid came out. I was so excited to learn and meet with these top scientists. And then finally, I would say, um, going back to my interest in like education and mentorship, I have been able to take on a lot of medical education projects and roles, uh, both within the University of Illinois, um, as well as at the national level. Um, and that has been an incredibly awesome opportunity to see what careers are like, where you can blend medicine and research, but you can also be an educator to other students and other um, trainees and really serve as an advocate for your peers and for your patients on a national level. And so those have been really great opportunities that I don't think I would have had, um, all of them at least, if I had not pursued MD-PhD training. So with that in mind, I now want to turn it over to in kind of an open Q&A, and I want to go back to our pictures so that people know the names in case you have a specific question. Um, I am uh, writing down all of the emails as, as much as I can, so I will make sure to get to you all. Um, and you can feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat. Um, the first one that I saw for the open Q&A was, um, and again, we can have anyone, but not necessarily everyone has to answer the question. How can MSTP programs be evaluated against each other when you're applying to these programs? So how do you evaluate the pros and cons of different MD, PhD programs? And if any of our panelists, and sorry, May, I didn't get your picture on here, um, want to tackle this one, that would be great. I, I can I can I can go I guess um, I would say uh, one thing is MSTP versus not so you want to look at the the funding uh, some places that are not MSTP while they may completely fund your tuition don't give you uh, as competitive as, as a, of a stipend um, you also want to evaluate them based on your research interests uh, how many labs or PIs can you see yourself working with at each one of the different institutions. Um, also location, like you're going to be there for, you know, probably at least eight years. You want to try to, if you, you know, if you can help it to be at a place that you think you would be happy living at. Uh, yeah, I, I think those are, those were my big things. I uh, also with the medical school, uh, you want to look at the curriculum, right? Uh, a lot of places uh, have very different curriculums. Um, some places do pass fail, which is a trend. Some places do still have letter grades for their uh, first couple of years. That could be uh, like a source of extra added stress. I really liked at UIC how we had a really cool new curriculum and uh, we're pass fail. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you want to look at the med school, you want to look at the advisors, and you want to see, uh, I guess, also in some ways, the compensation and the location. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, does anybody else want to kind of add on to what Nathan said? I'll add one quick note. Um, if they have like a, a program website and there are current students there, do not be afraid to send a couple emails and be like, hey, I'm interested in applying. Like, can you tell me about your experience? Most places, the students are very willing to chat. And um, I think it's a good way to get some sort of insider experiential information that otherwise you would only learn at an interview. Um, so it's a, it's a good strategy if you're struggling to kind of rank things or, or make decisions. And also just super fast, I think I don't think it's bad to start ranking programs until after you interview. I know for me, um, I had like rankings or places where I wanted to go and I interviewed there and I did not get a good vibe and I did not see myself spending eight years in that program. And so at the end of the day, you always have to go with your gut and like where you think you're going to be the most comfortable and that's going to help you be the most successful. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So we had another question that says, uh, would you say that MD-PhD programs look more at heavy research experience 
um, compared to clinical experience or what in, when applying to MD, PhD versus uh, traditional MD programs? I can answer this because I relatively recently got in the program. Um, so I would say for MD, PhD, there's more of an emphasis on kind of your research background and kind of what you did. And really, I want to highlight, it doesn't matter what you did necessarily or how many publications you had. It's really of if you were passionate about it, if you know about it, if you're confident that you want to be in a program like this, because part of it is they're trying to assess, you know, they don't want you to drop out of the PhD portion. They want to see you through to the end and, and to get the MD PhD. And so you really have to be confident that you want to do both aspects. So they really look at the research. And then the added benefit is if you do have some clinical experience, you can kind of intertwine that into your interview and say, I've done both and I like both and I can't see myself doing either one, which is kind of what our program is. I can chime in a little bit too. So um, as someone who I only apply, I applied to 10 school or 12 schools, I did two MD PhD programs and then I did 10 MD programs and I interviewed primarily MD. So I had three MD interviews and then one MD PhD interview. And I will say that the application process is almost exactly the same. You can set up your application almost identically. Like you wanna emphasize your research because that's something that you're passionate about and something that you dedicated a lot of time to, even in an MD application. I'd say the big difference is in your MD PhD application, there's an extra essay. And then the MD PhD interview is going to be more research focused. Um, otherwise, like you, you wanna showcase your experiences, not necessarily clinically relevant. Awesome. Uh, so we had another question. This is a great question. Um, if you were not in an MD PhD program, what do you think you would be doing or studying? I'm interested to see if the answer would be an MD program for most of you all or not. Um, so I can actually start with that one. Um, I let me start by saying I'm I'm very happy that I'm doing the dual degree and and having been in medical school and having done the kind of graduate training and vice versa, having had medical training and going into graduate school, I can tell you that each of them synergizes so well with the other. And you have such an advantage going into a PhD program, having had some medical training because you're able to really ask clinically relevant questions. And then vice versa, when you return to medical school, you're able to understand the kind of the basic science and have the really great critical thinking skills when it comes to approaching unknown questions in patient care. Now, if you ask me though, if I had to choose between the two, I personally would choose the MD every single time. I love medicine, I love working with patients, and I love the flexibility that being a physician and a physician leader um, affords one to really contribute in terms of advocacy um, and research and, and stuff like that. So that would be my answer. Um, does anybody else on the panel want to chime in there? Or does anybody feel differently? Who would choose PhD? Um, I'm gonna just bounce off of what Joe just said and kind of finish a thought. But you can also, as an MD, you can still do research. You don't have to have a PhD. So if that's something you think you'd want to do, that's not a limitation. However, as a PhD, you cannot practice medicine. So that's another way to look at it. Um, you would not be participating in patient care. Um, I personally literally can't picture myself doing anything else right now. Although every time, now and then when it gets hard, I'm like, maybe I'll be an alpaca farmer. I don't know, but otherwise I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else on the panel have anything to add to I, that question? Just really quick, uh, I told myself that if I didn't get it on the first go, I was just going to go do a PhD. Um, I think I would have deeply regretted that, like just doing the PhD. Yeah, fair enough. All right. I, I definitely Bye. still would have done med school for sure. Um, I just want to throw in one little tidbit. You're seeing a pattern that most people are like, if I had to pick in reality, I probably would pick the MD. Um, it's not always the case, but that tends to be like slightly the majority. Um, when you interview, they will secretly hope that you say the other thing. I'm just going to throw that out as an expert tip. 
they'll ask you the most about your research. They'll care the most about your research. And if they said, if you had to pick, which one would you, they want you to say the PhD, even though for most of us, that's not really true. You didn't hear it here. That's funny. Um, all right, so our next question. Uh, how did your MCAT score factor into your application and interview process? And how did you elaborate on your score if it was below the school's average that you were applying to? I see a finger up from May, so we'll start with you. And then um, if anybody else- Thank you. I mean, that would be great. Sorry, I love this question because I thought about it a ton. So I would say short answer, the MCAT score matters the most before you get the interview. And what I mean by that is if there are places who care about it that much, they won't offer you the interview in the first place. Once they offer it to you, the best advice I can give you is to just throw it out the window and pretend it doesn't matter and focus all of your interviewing energy on what you're great at. Um, I had a secret little gold mine, which is that my undergrad research was really weird. Um, and I did limer generation research on salamanders, which lots of people don't really do. So I spent like 99.9% .9 of my time talking about how cool and weird the salamanders are and how awesome it was to get to do salamander stuff. And I think that that completely outshadowed the fact that my MCAT was not just below MD PhD average, but was below MD only average. Um, so some places will care on your application. And if they don't give you an interview, you there's a million reasons why that could be the case. But I would say your essays are the first opportunity to talk about why you deserve a shot, regardless of your numbers. And your most important opportunity is in an interview because the places that never get to meet you don't matter. All you really need to care about are the places that do get a chance to meet you. And at that point, like you might get a shady interviewer who's like, oh, it's kind of a weirdly low MCAT score. It happened to me a couple of times or like I got a C minus in organic chemistry because I'm terrible at chemistry. And a couple of people were like, it's a pretty bad chemistry score. And I just was like, well, good thing I'm not going to be a chemist. And that was it. So like, just be prepared to kind of fire back and be like, you know what? That's not the most important thing about me. And as long as you know the most important thing about you and you can talk about it, that's what people will remember. Awesome. Thank you, May. Does anybody else on the panel want to respond to the MCAT question? If there's no one else, I'm just going to chime in and say, um, I, I was lucky enough to do well on my MCAT, um, but I have since not done great on other tests that also matter further on. And I'm like very vocal about this because I feel like our training puts so much emphasis on these exams and it's like a one day performance of eight hours of your life. Um, and I just want everyone to know that numbers do not define you. They are like one quick, easy metric for applications to be reviewed, but there are a million other ways for you to make impressions. So please do not feel completely disheartened if you don't have an excellent MCAT score. That is not a reason for you to disqualify yourself. Agreed completely. Thank you both May and Corey. Um, our next question is, um, I think I'll give a brief answer and then I'm going to actually turn it to Maggie. Um, and it is, does anybody know anything about non-traditional MD-PhD programs like history, anthropology, public health, philosophy, epidemiology, mathematics, or computer science? Um, so I'll give you kind of a blanket answer. And then I, I want to turn it over to Maggie, who's doing her PhD in public health, who can actually uh, talk about it a little bit. So um, it really does depend on the program. Um, what I will say from my experience in the seven years here at UIC is that um, if there is a, a department that you feel really adamant about doing your PhD in, there's always a conversation to be had with the program directors. And many times, actually every time I've heard of that happening here, when our students go and talk to the directors, they've been very supportive. Now, some MD PhD programs um, in the country, um, particularly the non MSTP ones, have even more um, flexibility with this. If you're funded by the NIH, there is a little bit of a um, necessity that your PhD has to be related to biomedical research. So if you were going to do, let's say, like a history PhD about like cold, the Cold War, um, then it might be a little bit challenging. But again, um, you can definitely have that conversation early on as early as possible with uh, directors even before applying and seeing what their thoughts on that are. Um, but Maggie is doing her PhD in the School of Public Health. So I wanted to turn this over to her to talk about what that's been like. So yeah, just to echo what Joe said is if 
your program or institution has the department available, it's not excluded as an option for you. I will say that our preferential if it is healthcare related. Um, I am doing my PhD in epidemiology in the School of Public Health. I am, I think, the second student at UI in the MSTP program to do epidemiology. And then there's one other student who's doing their PhD in health policy. Um, I will say that it hasn't been easy in terms of kind of charging a new path um, for different PhD departments. It's real, it's better when you have students that are already in programs and they're already in departments that can give you guidance. Um, but I will say that it has been really, really rewarding. And it, I feel like it fits really well with my path. And if you guys have specific questions about doing your public health or any public health related field and doing medicine, um, I can put my emails right there um, and you can reach out to me directly. Can I oh. add one quick note? Yeah. Um, there are some programs, and I really wish I remembered this from what feels like a thousand years ago, but there are some MD PhDs that will specify like on their websites that like we are an MD PhD program that also offers PhDs in these categories. Um, you kind of have to do some digging, but on the AAMC website, there is a huge list of all of the US and Canadian accredited MD PhD programs. And you can click through all of their websites really easily. If you know right now that you do want one like outside of uh, like sort of a lab science, take a look and see if there are some programs that already have that set up. Um, but just know that you can you can ask and like put up the the advocacy for yourself anywhere you go but there are programs that are already kind of turned that way. So that may be a good resource for you. Great points. Thank you guys. Um, so the next question that we got is um, maybe for Corey and then me, um, how do you not lose touch with what you learned in your M1 and M2 years over your graduate years? Does the gap in clinical education get in the way maybe when you go back to M3 and M4? So Corey, I feel like you might be the best person to tackle this one. Y'all, I was so nervous about this. Like, I was super nervous. Um, so what I can say is that those two years of you busting your butt, memorizing and learning medical knowledge, it comes back like riding a bike. I was so overwhelmed during that learning, but it's, it's in there. It's, it's deep in there. Um, so one, don't worry too much. Two, the third and fourth years, while obviously they call on that knowledge, they're a very different like way of implementing that learning. And you have the space to recall it over time. Like you don't always have to have something like immediately recalled from your memory. Um, and like Joe mentioned earlier, um, the critical sk thinking skills and the self-management that you learn over your PhD years put you leaps and bounds ahead of the other M3 students that you will be joining. Um, that has been very palpable for me. Um, the other thing I would say is that you obviously have opportunities to maintain that medical knowledge throughout your PhD. One of the things that I did was volunteer for like the student run free clinic at our, our school. Um, and granted, that's not helping me remember like every little genetic mutation that I memorized, but it definitely did help me like keep up on drug names and keep up on like, what is diabetes management look like? The real bread and butter of medical practice. So there's definitely like some reason to be concerned because it feels like a long time off. But what I can say is from my experience this year is I've been pleasantly surprised with how, how well the transition has gone and how, how able I am to like pick up where I left off. Awesome. Thank you, Corey. Um, and the only thing I would add is very similar. There are ways to kind of maintain some of that knowledge uh, throughout your graduate training. First of all, like if you happen, I'm in the lab of, a, of the head of the neurology department. He's a physician scientist. So everything we do revolves around neurologic disease. Um, and that's really helpful. And I've been able to go into the clinic and into the hospital with him. On top of that, though, and Corey just mentioned this in the chat, is um, that I have been uh, very much involved in our peer education program. Um, May mentioned this earlier, uh, tutoring. So I've done gross anatomy tutoring in the lab, neuroscience, immunology. Um, and then May and I actually helped design a, uh, a peer 
uh, tutoring or TA session for the USMLE step one exam. And so stuff like that helps you maintain that knowledge as well. Um, I think what we're going to do now is we're just going to have one last question for one last person. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. But uh, this one is actually for Reggie. And it says, can you describe how you got over your first year jitters as a first year medical student? Were you nervous? How did you approach it? And um, just because uh, the recording is going to end in three minutes, if you could kind of keep it somewhat short, that would be great. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I'm still having first year jitters. Um, <laughs> I would say you will be surprised by how many people are also in the same position as you and how much comfort you'll find in sharing this experience with other people. Um, our MD PhD class for this year is like relatively very large. Um, and so we like have a group chat where we just like kind of reflect and, and meme and talk about everything. So uh, I think I've gotten over my jitters the short answer is just by like leaning on my peers um because like there's they understand what you're going through and then also you like actually learn things in medical school and so like what's also been cool is like when my mom like asks me about things i'm like oh i know about this it's like xyz this is the receptor that like deals with that and all the mom doesn't know what a receptor is she's like oh cool so it's just time like time time will heal all jitters <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Reggie. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for coming in on a Friday night. I know this isn't the most optimal time, but it worked with our schedules and with COVID going on. Um, I also want to thank everybody that attended. We had a great turnout tonight from people, people not only at UIC, but all over the country. So this was really incredible. And we're really excited to launch a whole series of uh, panels and discussions like this going into next semester. So definitely keep in touch, look out for additional events. Uh, you can always email me. Um, I'm going to be the one at least for this uh, academic year kind of organizing and, and running a lot of this, but you'll see familiar faces over, over the course of the year. I'm putting my email as well as my Twitter in the thing. So you can feel free to reach out to me however you want. You can check out our UIC MSTP program website or the Twitter and Instagram pages to kind of keep in touch. We did record the emails, so I'll definitely uh, reach out to you guys. And like I said, our next event will focus on applying to MD-PhD programs specifically. This will be in early spring 2021. Um, and this session was recorded and I will try to send it out to everybody who put their email in the list. Um, and if you're not, if you're watching this later on or something, you can always email me uh, with more questions or ideas for what you'd like to hear from us. So thank you guys so much. Uh, enjoy your weekend and have a happy holidays.